Uh, well, lovely to see you uh, all in the room. And I have no idea, we were just saying, uh, sat here, that we have no idea how many people are on the virtual uh, stream. But wherever you are, it's absolutely fantastic to see you. Uh, if you're in the right place, we're here to talk about shared decision making. If that wasn't what you thought you were joining, there's an opportunity for you to leave and find something else, but we'd rather you didn't. How's that? Uh, let me introduce myself, and then I'm going to ask each of my colleagues to introduce themselves just before we get into the uh, conversation. We'll run this a little bit like any questions, so uh, for those of you in the room, if you do have questions, you need to post them in the chat, uh, not live in the meeting. If that's uh, okay with you, that would just be really helpful for us organisationally. So my name is Colin Melville. I'm the Medical Director and Director of Education and Standards here at the GMC. I'm here to chair this session, but it was one of my teams uh, who were responsible for producing the latest guidance on decision-making and consent, which was published last year. I'm going to be very boring and go down the line, as it were. Uh, Helen, for your information, you're last uh, in the line-up, but I think you can see that, and it's great to have Helen here from Scotland. But Rachel... Hi, thanks for million, Colin. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm the Chief Executive of the Patient Association. We're a non-disease, non-condition-specific charity, so we deal with issues that affect all patients. Um, I've been there for five years, and one of our passions and strategies around patient partnership, but patient partnership in the design and delivery of services. Um, but we really believe that that has to start with shared decision making, so I'm really delighted to be here to talk about how we can get patients and professionals working together for the best outcomes. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. Rabina. Uh, thank you, Colin. So my name is Rabina Shah. I'm a Professor of Medical Education and Psychosocial Medicine at the University of Manchester Medical <coughs> School. I'm also the director of the Double Day Centre for Patient Experience, one of the first universities and indeed medical schools to have a dedicated centre which focuses on patient partnership. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, Ravina. And Helen, you're very welcome. I hope now that when you speak, we will hear you and everyone else will hear you, but over to you. Uh, thank you, Colin, and thank you for um, bringing a lifelong ambition to be a disembodied head on a TV screen <laughs> in a lecture hall. Um, so my name's Helen Mackey. I am um, a clinical advisor to Scottish Government. Uh, I work in the CMO's directorate and particularly uh, around the policy of realistic medicine. And one of the main domains of realistic medicine is uh, how do we share, get better at sharing decisions with our patients? Um, and uh, hopefully I can give you some of our insights and some of the work that we have learned uh, over the years on that. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. And I hope, I hope you'll agree we've got a very uh, useful panel that reflects both public and professional um, perspectives. Now, uh, I, I need to ask uh, somebody else to help me here. There is a poll which we just need to run. Uh, if you're in the room, I'm afraid you need to partake of it on the app. And my apologies if you have not downloaded, logged in, or anything else on the app. I'm afraid you won't be able to take part. But there is a question, and it simply asks, what do you think is the most significant barrier to doctors having good conversations with patients? So I'll just give that a few... Uh, moments to run. Uh, of course, I can hear you all uh, loudly saying, well, they all are. Uh, <laughs> and that's why we asked, what is the most, uh, the most significant barrier? So, okay. Now, as it happens, I can see the emerging results, which we will come back to uh, a little bit later on. Do we think we've captured everybody? I have no idea. I'm looking to my colleagues at the back. OK, we'll let that run for a few more minutes just to see if anyone else uh, wants to respond. Well, uh, how about we start from the beginning then? Um, what do we mean by shared decision making? Because there's actually quite a lot of guidance, including the GMC's guidance, and, and the profession, medical profession has lots of tools to support them. But maybe we don't all mean the same thing when we say it. So I think that would be a really good place to start. So I just wonder... From your perspective, Rachel, what, what would it mean for a patient or a member of the public? What does shared decision-making mean? So I can see that some of the case studies that we worked with you are flashing up behind here, and I think there's been some... And we, we worked as DMC to develop those case studies from real patients about what, what they experienced from shared decision-making. So I think, for me, the, the starting of any relationship between a healthcare professional and a patient is starting with with asking that question about what matters to you. 
because I think if we start there and understand and look at look at a patient more for more than their, their condition or their disease, but actually understanding what that person is about and looking to shape the intervention and, and the medical advice to that. I think if we start with what matters to you, I think that is shared decision making. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I think historically in medicine, we've, we've asked patients, what's the matter with you? And I think it's an interesting shift of emphasis, in, isn't it, into the question, what matters to you? And I think as we go through this conversation, we'll see that those two things, of course, are not the same uh, thing. Helen, can I turn to you, you next from a, maybe a profession's perspective? Yeah, so I, I think that kind of sums it up very effectively. It's what matters to the patient. And I think realistic medicine is very much about um, having that meaningful conversation with the individual. Uh, it's about working out, understanding that there's two experts in the room. Um, I may be an expert um, about gastroenterology, which is my clinical background, but the patient is an expert of themselves, their context, their biography, uh, and their preferences and their wishes and values and beliefs. And I think it, it's really important that we, we elicit those. And Rabindra, uh, your background, of course, psychology and uh, medical education, what, what's your thoughts on what does shared decision making mean? I think, I think for me it's more about having an outcome-focused conversation. So if you have an outcome-focused conversation within the characteristics of partnership already described by Rachel and also by my colleague there, Helen, it's really interesting to see how, how the, the elements of that conversation begins to emerge from the personal to the professional and also vice versa. And I think by deconstructing how we've always described shared decision-making as an outcome of effective communication, we begin to change the landscape in which that whole process of the conversation begins to elicit the preference, begins to allow the patient to lead, and the co-leadership that emerges from that when we, you know, once the patient has left the room. And these are the features I think will be instrumental in our discussion today. And I feel at the same time as we are speaking, I'm sure many of you in the room and online will be thinking about your own definition of what shared decision making actually means. And do we use that term? For many, it's, it's an unfamiliar term because we have our own language to describe that very uh, interaction. And so it'd be really interesting to hear from colleagues in the room and from, from our panel today uh, how, that begins, how we begin to evaluate that in a sense of purposeful change through the conversation with the patient as a co-leader, not just a partner, but as a co-leader in transitioning between the different stages of that sometimes medicalised or over-medicalised model that we're so intuitively wanting to learn more about without recognising that a conversation can also be a very fluid piece. So I want to build on those concepts as we continue. So if I could just take that a little bit further. <coughs> I think the risk is that we talk about something that we think we all know what we mean and we perhaps aren't. So I want to tease apart which bit is shared and whose decision is it? Because I think um, a lot of us, uh, perhaps who've been in medicine for a long time, we, we, which we'll come to, we talk about evidence-based medicine. So what is it that we're sharing and who's making the decision? Because I, sometimes I think that there is a sense that somehow, because I know so much as a doctor, I'm the one making the decision, but I'm going to sense that that is not right, and actually I don't agree with it, of course. Can I just explore that a bit more? When we say shared, what, what is it that we're sharing, and how do we get to the decision? Because that seems to me to be the critical part of, of this conversation. So I don't know, Rabin, do you want to come back on that, and then I'll ask uh, well, Rachel. Well, for, for me personally, as I said earlier on, sometimes we don't de use definitions to describe what, what's happening. There is no word that exists or a sentence that exists. <coughs> it's just a, a process of change that you are encountering as a patient, but, but the medical doctor, let's talk about the doctors in this instance, uh, who are trained uh, and go through a programme of different stages to be able to communicate well with the patient in order to give an informed um, and I would say shared in that respect, understanding back to the patient about what's happening in response to what matters to you. Okay. And I think, for, for me, in, the, in, that whole, in that whole process, people adjust to the conditions that we set as healthcare professionals, that doctors set from the, out, from, from the point uh, that your patient comes through the door. And I think that's where the sharing 
actually begins because we need to talk about the environment, the setting in which the conversation takes place. And we don't talk about those things. They are variables that we can control and we can use to influence how the person that is the patient who is in front of us can communicate something very important to them in a safe environment with a caring doctor who they know is going to do the best for them because they are willing to listen and to learn and to understand exactly the impact of the person's change that they're experiencing upon them. So interesting, you say, what element is shared and what element is, you know, is owned? I think we, should, we, should, we patients who also need to feel comfortable and to be educated within this kind of uh, uh, remit. We make an assumption that everybody knows that this is how you behave when you go into the consultation room. That's a really interesting uh, um, area to unpack as well, and we don't have time for that. But, but for me, going back to where the ownership then lies, if you go through the process well, and the adjustments are made in, in, with the focus and the context of the patients, then the decision, the outcome decision, really needs to rest with the patient because they have led the conversation by being able to, because of the environment and the way that the, the doctor has, has motivated them, encouraged them to speak freely about what really matters to them. So, but the end result has to be what the patient agrees to be, the option that they've ch chosen to take because it's been an informed decision. So, it's a, I mean, it's a, very, it's a big question. <laughs> I've had to summarise it in the best way that I can. And there are so many elements of it, yeah. but I think there is this point of what is shared, it's a good question, but what is also owned. I think we both own the process, but that has to be worked through over time. And the culture at the moment within medical education and that postgraduate level is not quite there yet. Do you want to... I'm going it. to try come back in on that, um, <laughs> because there's a lot there. Uh, so I think a lot of it's about trust. Hmm. Um, I think it's about the relationship, and I think that's where, for, especially for patients with longer-term conditions, that continuity of care, because you, you get to know each other and you understand what matters to the patient. But So it is shared, and it needs to start, and I think what your point there is really good, it needs to start about where in the environment where that's going to happen, um, and the minute you start having a conversation with the patient, it's about how we're going to access those services, what's really important to you. But also, if there's trust and if there's confidence, also maybe some patients do want the medical profession to make the decision for mm. them. So, mm. you know, it, but that's where if you've got a level of trust going with the patients, the patients are able to say, well, actually, I now need you to tell me what the next step is. But we've all heard the stories of people having treatments where, you know, there's, there's always that story of that consultant about a knee operation, and just before the operation, he said to somebody, um, she was walking out of the room and she said, oh, I'm so glad I'm going to be able to go back and do my garden again. She's quite an elderly woman. She's going to knee down. And he kind of said, you're never going to be able to do that. That's not going to happen. And she said, well, why am I having my knee surgery? Because I don't need it for anything else. So it's about matter understanding what matters to the person as well. And I think you've told, you know, I'm looking at the results coming in here. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to <laughs> destroy. I'm not going to do any um, pre-results. But... I think there's a lot about confidence as well, because in the training, and you and I have spoken about this before, mm -hmm. Rubina, mm -hmm. you're trained to make decisions for people, because you're experts, you're there. I know we've got two medical students who want something here today with us as well. So, you know, you're working really, really hard with that, so to have the confidence to be able to sit with the patient and say, actually, how are we going to get you the best outcome for what you want to do in your life um, and what you want to happen? And I think that's where the share, sharing happens. Now, I'm, I'm very conscious, Helen, in your very particular <laughs> bodiless form, that it's easy to leave you out of the conversation. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to do that. So please feel free to chip in. And I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, so I, I would just add, you know, so the, the original definition of evidence-based medicine by Sackett talks about three kind of um, concepts. So one is uh, best medical evidence. And that is, I think, where the clinician really comes in, able to explain the, the, the best option for that individual. But also, there's clinical judgment and there's patient preferences. And you really need all three of those um, the means to interact. So I think the skill and art of a clinician is eliciting the preferences from uh, person, um, explaining the alternatives, um, and then together just coming to a, a decision about what's best for that. 
patient in that context. Um, I think it's also important to think that sometimes that a patient's preference might not be available uh, or, it, or the doctor might not think that it's appropriate. And I think we have to be honest that there are sometimes these uh, conflicts. Um, so it's not about um, the doctor knows best. It's about really kind of exploring, um, you know, what matters to the patient. And it might be that an individual chooses to take a path that we would not choose for ourselves. Uh, so, for example, someone who um, wants to smoke and it's their only pleasure in life, and they're not going to give up smoking, even though you can give them evidence uh, that that's um, going to be beneficial to you. One of my colleagues tells a great story about a man who um, who was a pigeon fancier, and he developed pigeons fanciers lung, and all the doctors kept saying you must give up your pigeons. And it wasn't until my colleague visited his house and was taken into the room, which was full of uh, trophies and pictures of these pigeons. And this man was never going to give up his pigeons because that was more meaningful to him. So he chose a, a path that we wouldn't have chosen, but he chose that with, um, with all the information. Uh, that, that is so helpful, Helen. It, it's it's great to have a real life example as well because I think that's one of our challenges I think as a profession isn't it we we can know what the evidence is that says that A is better than B or A is necessary over B but actually it's still for the patient to make that decision and if we link it across a little bit to the mental capacity act if you have capacity then you're allowed to make what we euphemistically call an unwise decision, which means I might think it's unwise, but it's not unwise from your perspective. So, so that is so, um, so important. There's a couple of comments in the chat, which is quite hard to read from here because it's in grey. <coughs> but um, Susie uh, Caesar raises a point about just saying that if we use the, and that's not helpful because it's now gone, oh, there it is again. Uh, <laughs> if we use the phrase evidence-informed decision-making, it fits better with the idea. I think what it shows is that however we try and describe this succinctly in words, never quite says, and it is about the conversations, um, isn't it? So um, just, just going on then, so one of the things we cover a lot, uh, I guess, is consent in the form of the education pathway. And perhaps, um, Rabina, this is closest in a way to your um, area of, um, of expertise and, and practice. Do you think we're doing enough? Could we do it better? I mean, I suppose the answer is always we can do things better. What do we need to do to help um, particularly medical students, but also uh, younger um, doctors or doctors earlier in their profession be, be able to get with it? It's easy perhaps for me at the end of a career, because I can draw from a lot of experience, much harder when you don't have that um, background. Thoughts about medical education and how we can frame that? Is that the solution? I think it's really important to look at this more globally. So I would start up, if you're interested in going into medicine or any other healthcare profession, consider first your pre-entry point should be, how comfortable am I with, with people? How comfortable am I speaking to patients? How comfortable am I to have a difficult conversation? Because when we talk about communication, it isn't always an easy ride, is it? Sometimes we're talking about very personal, very uh, difficult topics, and the patient may be anxious and frustrated, and uh, they too are not coming to terms with what they have. Then they know they're going to hear and what they have to also present as, as part of that, that, that partnership, that dialogue. So there's some things that happen pre-entry into the healthcare profession. Then in, within an undergraduate medical education, now everybody who's in this room or online who teach within a medical uh, school, they all know there is a very structured curricula which looks at clinical uh, communi communication, clinical consultation skills, and significant illness, and how we manage that, how we, how we do you know, use different models and, and, and structured elements of uh, good communication and what that looks like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, in the real world, if you are year one, um, a medical student, you, you can be quite fearful of that whole concept, because you don't know what to expect. 
you know you're going to be measured in terms of your performance and your behaviour and your values. There's something within this wider lens that we need to look through which talks about behaviour and having the yeah. right values and having the right conversation at the right time in the moment, which enables the patient to feel comfortable with you. And then the third, third thing I would say, at Manchester Medical School, we have brought in a third lens, and the third lens is what I mentioned earlier on in, in the introduction. We, we have a dedicated double-day centre, and that is um, supported by medical education partners. The medical education partners are not simulated patients or expert patients. They're recruited from the public yeah. because they're interested uh, in supporting and training our future doctors. They come with the experience of being a carer, a family carer, or they have been a patient, or they're just generally interested in the accountability element of being a good doctor. So I think all of these different features absolutely matter because the impact on the way the consultation then takes place. Because conversations don't take place in isolation, they take place within a, a context. And what we have done at, at Manchester Medical School through the Double Day Centre, we've also established a dedicated medical student society which focuses and emphasises partnership. And they are unpacking and reframing and defining what partnership means to them. And that's, I think, is, is absolutely marvellous because we need to be more innovative like that. And this comes in as part of the extracurricular because the, the, the main curriculum is just so busy. But the fact that we are doing this, I, I think, is going to train a different type of doctor. And now we have, at national level, the Double Day Centre, at the Royal Society of Medicine, we have a Double Day National Prize. And that prize is an essay for any medical student from any medical school to apply for, and the focus is partnership. So we're changing the landscape of you know, the language. We're making it meaningful and we're developing that attachment with our students to say, well, what does that partnership look, for, look like for me in busy a &E when I was a year three doctor? What did they look like for me when I was in year two? So you know, the growth and the intelligence and the maturity that comes from that different lens adds more value. Post-graduation, there's so much there, isn't there? We have the uh, Health Education England, we have all of the RCPs and all the, uh, the, all the things that go with it. So we are checking that balance all of the time. But what really matters is whether there's been a shift in, from undergraduate level to postgraduate level that they have retained the learning, which has been different, yeah to be that new doctor, to be the new future, to enable and to embed the principles we've taught them at the beginning so well that they don't get knocked out of them because they, they are leaders in their own right. And by leading by example, they've taken ownership of that journey. And I think that for me is, is, this, is the sea shift change. That's, fa that's fantastic. I, I, I think we get the passion <laughs> and it's so great to see. But Helen, uh, you've been involved in realistic medicine and I think there's a nice sort of segue, isn't there, So uh, from undergraduate and some of the work you're doing on lifelong um, uh, processes in, in communication and, and, and training. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so we, we conducted a citizen's jury uh, a couple of years back and the second highest recommendation for them was that they needed to be training for healthcare professionals lifelong. And this came from uh, people recognising that some of us uh, doctors are much better at communicating than others. Um, and uh, it's one of those skills that you, you can learn at a university, uh, but then it's all about the context and the context that you apply it in. A bit like Rubina said, if you're busy in A&E, uh, you might have a slightly different conversation um, consultation style than if you were in, you had a more leisurely afternoon clinic. Um, so you can become skilled and de-skilled over time. So what we've been working with uh, National Education Scotland to, to, to develop, uh, we've got an online module called Realistic Conversations, which explores shared decision making, not only the kind of communication style, but also that kind of um, hierarchy of information um, and that relationship uh, between uh, the, the doctor and the person uh, and ensuring that uh, you enable the person to ask the questions that they want to ask um, and that there is some evidence to say that when we consult with patients often the doctor spends most of the time talking uh, rather than listening and rather than answering questions so I think it's about being really intentional in, uh, you know, giving, uh, in, during the consultation, giving time uh, for those questions to come out uh, and, to, and to really answer them as, as best we can. 
Uh, and I think that gives us a really nice segue into actually revealing uh, the poll results, <laughs> uh, which I don't know, is that now in the app or on the screen, or where will it be? There you go. Um, I'm going to guess that's not a surprise to anybody in this room. But you talked about time, uh, and Rabina touched on time, and I think, R Rachel, I know. So maybe I can come back to you, Helen. So how do we manage this then? So complicated stuff sometimes, and time is a pressure. How do, how do we deal with that? So time, is, it, it's a difficult one, because you give time to what you value. And sometimes investing time earlier saves your time in, the, in the, 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 the patient's pathway. Now, it might not be for you. Uh, you might actually save uh, an unnecessary an appointment, an unnecessary investigation by investing more time at the start to elicit preferences. Uh, a little bit what we talk of Al Mully talks about the, uh, the patient preference misdiagnosis. As doctors, we, we get more worried about if we, we make the wrong d diagnosis on a scan or a test. But actually, if we don't spend time working out what that patient wanted, we could put them down a whole path causing harm uh, rather than um, uh, you know, kind of investing in treatment that they want. Um, so I think if you value shared decision making, you need to find the time and you need to recognise that this will give you time back perhaps later on. So, for example, complaints. Um, the vast majority of our complaints in the health service are due to poor communication. Uh, so think about five more minutes spent with a patient explaining the side effects, risks and benefits might actually save you two hours in replying uh, to, to a concern or, or, or a complaint later on. Uh, but the most important things, I think sometimes it gives time back to the patient and also gives, gives time to the system. Uh, because it's almost as though sometimes we get caught into this cycle of, okay, you must have a test, this test says that you need X uh, expert to see you, and you get on this treadmill, um, whereas if you would actually ascertained the preferences right at the start, you, you could have made a much more personalised um, approach to that individual and got the outcome that they wanted with far less intervention. So it feels like some of what you're saying is about rethinking about the way we do things and the sequence in which we do to get the right value. How, how does that work from a patient perspective, Rachel? I'm completely agreeing with everything Helen was saying here. I forgot I had my mic on and I was probably talking, going, yes, yes, yes. So if, if, you know, at the end of the day, we have one life. And if, if we need medical care or, you know, we need, if patients deserve that time at the beginning because I think it's completely, and, I, and I'm sure there's evidence out there that if, if we can do shared decision really well or patient partnership really well, then that's going to have, A, the best outcome for the person that you've gone through so much training to try and help. Um, so that must be more motivational as a healthcare professional and time will save the system money. But the most important thing is the patients will have the best outcome to live their lives to the full. So I was quite interested in the, because it talks about patients' confidence and skills here as well and culture and time. And I, I wonder how much the time and capacity is part of the culture as well because it's about leadership saying actually we need to get it right for patients and give that time to have the best outcome. Rabina, do you want to...? Well, that's a double whammy, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> it is. Time and capacity, they're both issues in their mm. own right. And we had, um, uh, we've spoken about this earlier in the morning, that we know that the capacity to manage patients effectively with the outcomes that they, they deserve and the outcomes we want to give them is, is constrained by the environments in which we work, which are very heavily pressurised. And it's a real shame that the government hasn't, didn't go ahead with the, the workforce strategy because if, if we had that, that's one way forward to really truly understand what is the composition of a, you know, of a GP practice or an A&E uh, department or you know, um, a surgical unit which will make it more effective if we have the right people there to provide that care in the right manner at the right yeah. time. So that's why it absolutely is a little alarming. So I would say to that, invest in the time that matters to you at that moment. Invest in what you can control. And think about what we know patients want to hear and want to see and want to experience from our yeah. conversation with them. So they want to be treated with kindness. They want to have an opportunity to say, 
respond to or what matters to you. They want to hear your expertise and they want to engage in that partnership. So invest in the partnership as a principle and ground that in the time that you have. Because we all recognise, and we're all, we have to be honest here, that sometimes that seven minutes or ten minutes is never enough, which is why follow-ups are important. But of course, of course, it all comes back to where the conversation takes place in the first instance. Is it your first encounter with the patient? Is your second or third? Is it a patient with long-term conditions? Is it a new patient presenting with, a, with something very, very different? And we're talking very generically in this room today. And I invite you all to another workshop to talk in more <laughs> detail about some of the, you know, the things we are trying to describe here. But I think workforce uh, capacity constrains your time. And many uh, of our clinicians go home tired, but they still go that extra mile. Yeah. And they steal time from their own time to give the best outcome for their patients. So, so is it possible just to develop that a bit further and think about, OK, so what are the practical steps? I think you've touched on some of, the, some of those things, but uh, I'm guessing there'll be other things. So something about how we use our time, something about the prioritisation of conversations. Mm. Are there other things that we, we need? Because I, I, I'm guessing most of my colleagues in the audience will feel that you know, time, is, time is a real enemy in all this. But I was very struck by one thing that you said, Ravina, when you talked about patience and kindness. Now, it's interesting because kindness is referred to in the in Good Medical Practice Review, but it means different things to different people. But there's something, I think you used values and behaviours, which I think is so helpful. Um, and, and it's something about the manner of our relationship as well, isn't it? Sorry, Rachel, it looks like you wanted to... No, no, I'm just reflecting on that completely, and I think it is about values and behaviour. Um, the Patient Association, when we launched a lived experience advisory panel, uh, I think we were into our seventh month, and we bring, I think we were telling you on the call about it, Rabina, but we bring um, 10 patients together, and these patients come from backgrounds of, of what could be perceived as inequalities. And I think... That value and behaviours and, and the issues around communication just and accessibility have come out so strong in that one of the gentlemen on, on, in the group had a, an appointment for uh, prostate treatment. And he came to me afterwards and he showed me the letter that he had received from the consultant. I barely understood what was written in that letter. Um, and, and the consultant had met this person. They knew well that they could not... But they, you know, they'd just written a letter. And to me, that was somebody... How would you treat another pe person like that? Mm -hmm. And not to, to look at that person and say, actually, how are we doing this in partnership? And we had to try and get help for him to understand what was in the letter. And um, so I think if we're, if we're working in shared values, and, and that's about the partnership as well, it's about the healthcare professional and patients agreeing those shared values and behaviours about how we work together. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I think often we say, well, I say to my, my, to my medical students, what do you want patients to remember about you when you've left the room, when you've gone? I, well, my clinical knowledge, you know, I was able to <laughs> solve the problem or whatever it is. But actually, what patients say that really should matter when we have feedback is that you showed kindness, you yeah. showed you were listening. You, you, you showed compassion. I, I could trust you. So trust is something that you have to earn. You earn trust. You earn respect. It's not a given. Irrespective of what title we hold or we don't hold, at a at face value, it is about making sure that we've done our best, again, going back to that moment, and that the, what is memorable is... Did I say it properly? Memorable. <laughs> what, what is important is that the patient feel, even though you weren't able to have the, the full consultation, there was un, unleft and unfinished business, they felt away happy that they would go back to you or you'd be seeing other patients with the right attitude, with the right manner, with that, in that listening mode and using that time to do the best that you possibly could because that is what the patient in that moment wanted to take away with them. And I think those kinds of, those little nuggets, and we all have them, we should talk about more often and not be afraid to. We call them soft skills. They're not soft no, skills. Yeah, it's the most fundamental skill that you learn over time and you experience and change as you transition in your role, whether you're a manager, whether you're a healthcare professional, or whether you're somebody involved in research, actually, because research, who 
who live, the, who live and breathe the stories of the lived experience tell us so much. So the snippets we had today were very purposeful and very grounding. So all of those things. I think you've touched on the point that um, Mashoud has asked about commenting on patient and doctor trust and decision making. And there's that phrase, isn't it? Trust me, I'm a doctor. But actually, that is exactly what we should be building. But we all often see that in a kind of trivial way. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I know, I know what I'm doing. But actually, it's not about I know what I'm doing. Yes. It's you can trust me because I'm being honest, I'm being mm. open, I'm being generous with my time for you in order to help you make your decisions. Helen, any experiences from, from your perspective and, and uh, in, in Scotland? Solutions? Yep. So, uh, again, going back to the citizens' jury, the, um, the top recommendation was that there had to be a national campaign uh, letting people know that they had the right to ask questions. So it's as simple as that, creating the conditions that you can encourage um, uh, people to ask you questions and questions that matter to them. Um, so that's why we've been um, promoting the brand, the Choosing Wisely questions, which is brand for short, which is benefits, um, what benefits to this treatment or intervention, risks, what are the harms, alternatives, uh, is there some other path I can take, and often the one that we forget is what happens if I do nothing, because actually sometimes doing nothing is the right thing, so <coughs> I go back to our pigeon fancier, uh, he didn't, you know, he wasn't going to change, he wanted to keep looking after his pigeons. So you could say that was an alternative, but it was an alternative to medicine. So I think it's about recognising that sometimes we don't have all the answers as doctors. Um, but what we can do is uh, really kind of elicit from our patients what their preferences are uh, and what outcomes they would want. The other thing that I think is important, going back to the kindness and the relationship, it's just about that small talk at the start of a conversation, a consultation. So as you're calling the patient in, um, you know, I'm a gastroenterologist, I've got lots of long-term patients. Um, and I enjoy that kind of little two minutes of connection. How are your family? How are your grandchildren? Uh, come on in, how are you doing? And you actually get lots of really useful information about the, their clinical condition, uh, just by the fact that they've been able to tell you that they've, um, uh, you know, sort of done a hike with their, their 12 year old grandson. Um, so I, th I think don't underestimate the kind of human relationship, the human kindness mm. uh, and the connection uh, that is important in consultations as well. And I think I'm right, Helen, is choosing, choosing Wisely, that's an app available in Scotland or is it available more widely? No, so the, the Choosing Wisely is just the five questions, but what we, we promoted was a national campaign, so we have posters up in pharmacies and adverts on the radio about it's okay to ask, it's all right to ask these questions. Uh, but what we have done is we've embedded uh, these questions in the patient-facing waiting room of uh, virtual consultation platforms. Uh, we use a platform called Near Me or Attend Anywhere. Um, so as the patient's waiting to, to come into the consultation, uh, these questions are there encouraging them to use it. Uh, and many health boards have also put this in their uh, outpatient letters. So when you get told where to turn up, you also get the five questions and we have posters up in many um, uh, waiting rooms uh, in, in acute care as well, uh, prompting people that it's okay to ask uh, and these are the types of questions you can ask. So as always in these sessions, we, we're rapidly running out of time and I think the conversation could clearly go on much longer, which I'm sure some of you will have uh, over lunch in a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask uh, each of you, if I may, just to say what, what would be your takeaway message? You've probably only got about 30 seconds each, but I wonder if in, in the course of doing that you could just pick up a query from Emma um, K, which I think is a really good point, uh, which I'd missed earlier. How do we manage patient expectations to limit consumerism? So it's kind of the inverse, isn't it? Patients come wanting something, but... Uh, that may be too complicated to answer, but um, do you want to go first, Rachel? I, Are you a consumerist? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to address that in 30 <clears throat> seconds because I have quite a lot to, to put on that one. But actually, if you genuinely believe in patient partnership and want to work with patients, that's not going to happen because you're going to have honest 
value-based conversation. So, um, yeah, I think it's about patient partnership. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Rabina? Well, what I say, consumerism is more a transaction. Yeah. So let's deconstruct the, con the transaction to outcome-focused conversation, which is shared. Excellent. And Helen? Uh, so we found in the citizens jury that actually patients understood the pressures on the healthcare yeah. system and the resources and wanted to use them wisely as well. So I think patients are, are less consumerist than we think. Um, and I, if my take home is I would want people to always think about that fourth question in brand, do nothing. Uh, because sometimes that gives you the best patient outcome and make sure you've, you, you've mentioned it uh, so the patient knows it's uh, an option. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to see it. I've managed to get through the whole session without my post-COVID cough, which I'm struggling with, but the water's worked. Um, so can I thank everyone in the room for being here? Thank you for joining us online. Uh, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to absolutely every question. And Emma, I can't see you, but if you are, I'm sure Rachel and you can meet up over lunch and have a natter. Uh, but thank you, everybody. Would you like to just uh, thank our panel in the normal way?